Hello there. Uh, in just a moment, the press preview. I'll look at what's in the morning's newspapers for you, but first, our top stories. The Prime Minister has refused to confirm if she knew about a Trident missile that malfunctioned off the coast of Florida in June, just weeks before a crucial Commons vote on whether to renew the system. The White House says it's in the early stages of talks to fulfil President Trump's pledge to move the US Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. A police officer has been shot in a drive-by attack at a petrol station in Belfast. It's the first shooting of its kind in Northern Ireland for eight years. You're watching the press preview on Sky News. Joining me this evening, journalist and talk radio presenter Julia Hartley Brewer and Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface. Well, time now to take you through the stories on the front pages, first of all. And the Prime Minister has written in the eye about her plan to reboot British industry, saying she wants to break down barriers to success. Theresa May also features on the Guardian front page, but with the focus on accusations a failed Trident missile test was covered up. The Mirror has that story too, calling it May's missile crisis. The Metro focuses on Mrs May's upcoming visit to the White House. The headline says, I'm no pussycat. May's trade deal will open door to US jobs. That's the Telegraph's take on the Prime Minister's talks with Donald Trump. The Financial Times says Mr Trump has set the tone of his presidency with an attack on dishonest media. While the star leads with the celebrities who turned out yesterday to criticise the US president. The Express claims one million migrants will rush into Britain before the country exits the EU. The Mail has a similar headline. It warns terrorists are on a fast train to Britain. The Times has a picture of the cast of the new train spotting movie, but it's leading on punitive business rates threatening the rural way of life. And the Sun features a warning from health officials that fried food increases the risk of cancer. It's gone with the headline, you've had your chips. Well, that uh, Julia Hartley Brewer and uh, Fleet Street Fox Susie Boniface. I always want to smile when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> Foxy Susie. Uh, we're starting with the, the Guardian. <laughs> the Guardian. Um, and uh, this uh, Theresa May uh, seemingly cover up now yep. uh, with the uh, Trident question. It's not looking good, I've got to be honest. Uh, she had an interview on Andrew Marr this morning, the BBC show, and uh, she was asked four times whether she had known anything about this uh, Trident missile test failing when she gave a statement to the House of Commons a few uh, weeks later uh, on her first big event set piece speech in the House of Commons after becoming uh, Prime Minister and after uh, becoming um, after, uh, uh, the first big statement. And it, was on, it was on whether or not we should spend 40 billion taxpayers' money renewing Trident. Might have thought it was relevant to the MPs and their constituents, the taxpayers who are going to be forking out that 40 billion quid over a number of decades that the last test of, a, of the Trident missile in the last five years hadn't actually worked. Now some experts might say well um, it, it was unimportant why it didn't work but a 17 well, it didn't work. It didn't work test. in the right direction. Just, well, yes, it, yes it was supposed to go <coughs> that way and it went that way. Um, yeah, but some, some people, there might be perfectly good explanations for why it wasn't an issue but all of these previous tests they've only been uh, five since 2000 they've made a really big song and dance about oh look at our nuclear missiles don't they do well. They didn't publicize this one. Um, it's clearly a cover-up and the idea that there's a big security risk in us knowing the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and everyone else will have been watching this. They will know perfectly well we had a missile test that went wrong. Um, the only people who don't know are the people who are paying for the darn thing. So she either knew or she didn't know and if she did know and didn't tell us big issues and if she didn't know why wasn't she told? Yeah and if, you, if you're being asked um, did you or did you not know that this missile had gone awry? Four times. Four yeah. times. And there are only two possible answers. Yes, I did. And no, I didn't. And if you say, yes, I did know, that's absolutely fine. I mean, she wasn't Prime Minister at the time of the test, but she was shortly afterwards. She was just before this vote. She should have had a briefing. She should have known about it, certainly. Um, and there is no harm at all in her saying, well, of course I knew. I'm the Prime Minister. What did you expect? If the answer is no, I didn't know, then that's pretty bad, and that's the only possible explanation. Well, it's pretty bad if she did know and didn't think it was relevant information for us to know. No, not, she could easily argue that, yes, I knew there'd been a, a misfire, mm. and no, I didn't talk about it publicly because that would have been a security issue. I suppose, yeah. And uh, to be frank, that explains why we need a renewal of Trident, so you know, yeah. the vote went the right way. The, the only reason that you might not answer the question is because the answer is no, I didn't know. Mm. And the problem with that is that she's not being informed properly as Prime Minister. Mm. There's a 
I, I think issue. I think it's the alternative that, to that, but I think both are equally damaging. And it's also well, it's, it, more damaging than anything else is the fact that we've got a missile which apparently is about as reliable <laughs> as they have in North Korea, because that's the last time I heard a missile going the way they wasn't expected to go, which is when they had a test firing um, mm. in Kim Jong Un. But, but as but, you say, there have been previous tests that, that have been successful, mm, that have been yes. publicised, and we have known about. And let's talk about so, those ones, yes. But, no, but the reality <laughs> is, the last one, the only one in the last five years, didn't work. Now, there, again, there may be perfectly good explanations, but as with all of these things with governments, it's always the. I, I mean, I don't think it's a cover-up as such. Well, I, it does smack of cover-up. If you don't ask the question, it does smack yeah, you don't, yes, of no, no, some sort of yes, cover-up. No, cover no, no, she hasn't been asked about... Yeah, she paperwork. She hasn't been asked, she hasn't been asked, she hasn't lied to Parliament as such. I mean, she has, uh, should we say, not not given the full truth. Well, she say. wasn't told the full truth, and she yeah, couldn't we don't know. the full truth. But again, it's all, governments always get into trouble when they try and keep these things under wraps. You're just not going to keep these things under wraps. And to be honest, the Trident missiles often get taken off the boats quite often, to be uh, repaired, refurbished. Uh, the old uh, missiles get broken down and re refurbished and then new warheads put back on them again when they go out. It's a normal process that happens. It's entirely possible that the you know, guidance chip in there was put in wrong, went awry, was made on a Friday afternoon. The normal excuse for these uh, things. I, but it does happen. But, but because times. of the, the, the lack of information, yeah, it right. has sparked more interest yeah. and yes. she's on a bit of a damage limitation path now, yes. following on from not answering the question. Yeah, exactly. And because it's a potentially new although it wasn't either, potentially a nuclear missile. There's lots of, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's in the world getting terribly excited, going, oh, we'd have bombed the wrong place. <laughs> it's not quite how nuclear missiles work. If it had gone wrong, it would have just gone splat. It wouldn't have been a nuclear detonation. But still, it causes a huge fuss. She, she should have just answered the question, yeah. because not yep. answering yeah. the question makes yep. more of a... Of well, a and there will, be, there will be more we're, questions. We're, we're already the second day of the story. Yes. And, and yeah. you know, another couple of days starts being a bit more of an issue. Yeah. Uh, staying with Theresa May, front page of The Telegraph, um, and this is about her future trade deals. And this uh, trip that's been brought forward, she's off to the States this week. Yeah, um, she can't open the door to any US jobs until after we've actually Brexited. Not just trigger Article 50, but actually be out of Europe. We can't officially agree or even really take part in formal negotiations with the US until after that. So, and we've already got about a million jobs in both countries that are reliant upon the other country, if you see what I mean, uh, and c uh, companies that are operating in one of those countries. So, She's not open. She's kind of just admitting that those jobs are currently there, that she would like to do some deal at some point in the future. The way Brexit's going, it's entirely possible those negotiations would happen after Trump has left office because he's <laughs> either the oldest yes. president they've had for a long time and won't make it uh, he's health the oldest wise. president he ever gets to be inaugurated, isn't he? Or he just, you know, goes completely and insane and gets sectioned. <laughs> um, so whatever trade deal there may be, maybe well after Trump's time one yeah, way or but, another. I mean, the thing is that there are going to be talks, of course, there. We already know there are talks with Australia, New Zealand. These are going to be ongoing at the same time. Not that we've got that many trade negotiators, but again, a lot of this stuff is in principle. I know the detail down the line you have to work on, but a lot of this stuff in principle. And look, the biggest issue over here is, is Trump and his protectionism. And that's a massive issue. And this whole America first line that we heard uh, at the inauguration speech. But the issues that he's got with China, the issues he's got with Mexico are very different in terms of a deal, with trade deal with Britain. Because we're not competing on, on, uh, on, cheap, you know, on, on lo, you know, low cheap, uh, cheap costs of labour and the like. We're not competing on that basis. We're going to be competing in other, you know, other high skilled jobs. I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us. And actually, this couldn't have come at a better time because we had a a, a president in Obama who he, he's looking to Merkel. The final phone call that he made as to a foreign leader was to Merkel. She was his, you know, go-to gal as, a, as an ally, not Britain. He made, had no interest in Britain at all. Uh, Trump considers himself how, an anglophile. How do you this read, is an opportunity. How do you read President Trump's uh, future relationship with Europe? <laughs> with, with Europe, look, he doesn't. He doesn't like the EU. He, he, I, I, he I, doesn't I, like anybody. Doesn't does like he? Um, I, I have to say, one of the things that I am, I, I, I totally agree with him on. And good God, I find myself struggling to say those words um, is, is about NATO and not about NATO being obsolete but the fact that all these countries including Germany which has been running a surplus for God knows how many years and spending only a fraction of its NATO commitment a treaty obligation by the way on defense the reality is that well, you know, America no has American taxpayers have been subsidizing European security for the last few decades and it's unacceptable we all need to pay our way Britain has been but again only just on a technicality and um, we shouldn't be American taxpayers paying to keep us safe from Russia it should be us um, and I think he's calling Angela Merkel's bluff, and quite rightly. We'll stay with politics. Uh, the Mail next. Let's have a look at page eight. Uh, this is Jeremy Corbyn and uh, article... Yeah, Jeremy 50. Corbyn uh, can't make his mind up 
about something else. <laughs> <clears throat> um, he can't make his mind up what things he's not going to make his mind up about next. He said the other day um, that we, we will I'll make my MPs back Article 50. Labour will back Article 50. The British public have voted for Brexit. This is what's going to happen. There is no way we will try to hold it up. Then it turned out that Clive Lewis, one of his uh, shadow ministers, said, well, actually, I would probably vote against Article 50. I don't think we should be triggering it now. At which point, Jamie Corbyn then starts to look like he's going, well, I can't actually make them do it so actually I won't say that I want them to do it therefore I won't be looking like I've been humiliated because they've ignored me and rebelled against me I just won't make them rebel against me in the first place and then you turn around and say that what he said last week is now completely different and <laughs> not, we're not going to have a three-line whip at all actually well, well according your, to that Her Majesty's I'm official that, opposition folks Mr Corbyn may agree yeah. to uh, a free <laughs> vote on the issue now that, yeah. that's yeah. been so, but he's, he's moved but again it's either party policy or, is it, or it isn't but again I, I, I find probably less, less <laughs> more shocking than of this incompetence of the, of the Labour leadership. Well, is it incompetence time. or is he listening is, to the various voices no, it within is his party? It's, 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 you, you should, you, if you're a party, you have to have a party line. It is not possible on the single biggest issue in facing this country for the next 10 years to not have a party line. We've got two by-elections coming up. Both Labour seats, uh, both are looking really questionable. One to the Tories, one possibly to UKIP at this point. It's, it's very dangerous. But the main thing is, as a Brexiteer, and this I find so outrageous, though, is is the likes of people like Clive Lewis, the Shadow Business Secretary, saying he doesn't think we should trigger Article 50. There is a formal, clear mandate, moral mandate for Article 50. Of course, we're going to see the Supreme Court judgment on Tuesday morning, uh, the Gina Miller case. Uh, pretty much everyone expects it to go against the government, and then we're going to have to have well, a bit Theresa of Theresa May has already said this. Yeah, going they're going to be, be yeah. But again, and we've been told, <clears> oh, don't worry, the Commons will vote through it through, and the, and, the, and the Lords. But the fact there will be democratically elected MPs who are going to vote against something which they themselves only a year or two ago gave a six to one mandate to have a referendum and give the decision to the British people I find absolutely shocking and I I really think the MPs who do you are doing really this, think Parliament's they, going to overturn the referendum no 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 they're going to know the fact that any MP would vote against the the the, the, the mandate well we the don't British know people. that any of them will they have to Owen Smith has stated Some of them that he said will. They, yeah, but we don't know after the debate, and actually when it comes no. to the crunch, that they definitely no. will. But this is interesting. So Diane Abbott, Diane point, Abbott yeah. was also doing the rounds this morning in an interview, and she's the Shadow Home Secretary. She was asked, is there going to be a, you know, are you going to try and change this uh, this Article 50? Are you going to try and uh, um, amend the bill? And she said, well, we haven't decided yet what, uh, what, what the amendments will be. But they've decided they're going to amend the bill. They haven't even seen the bill yet, and they've already decided they're going to amend it. I don't it. think you can rely it's, on the words of Diane Abbott. But no, but this, this is the thing. Much. This flip-flop, you've got to have a policy. We've got a Eurosceptic leader of a Remain party that represents a majority of Leave voting seats. They don't know what to do. And, and, and I think one of, you, one of the things you need in a politician and, and in a political party is people who, you don't, go, you, don't, you don't say things that you think voters should like. You should say, this is where I am. And this is why I believe this, well, and you should back me for that. To get back to the story, there are two issues of leadership here, which is where Corbyn has failed. Number one is he's um, refusing to lead the party in a particular direction. If he is the leader, he should say, this is what we're doing, yeah. bang, we're going over there and you're coming with me. Number one. Second one is he is completely unaware of what his party actually think. Because when it turns out that they disagree with him and they're going to vote against him, he's then going to change but his mind. Isn't that a leader who's listening? Oh, he would argue that he is, his fans would argue is. He should have listened before he opened his mouth. But how, then he would look but, like no, but, no, but he'd also, already... Can I finish? Then he would look like he listen. already knew what his... <laughs> yes, you. He would look like he already knew what his party are doing and they're in agreement and they're coherent together. He would look like a no, better that leader no, that wouldn't make if any he better did at all. what his party actually are going to do. No, like, you're both going, going to, to have to listen to, to me to, now to, because we're going to take a break. Coming up, why some of your favourite foods could cause cancer. Stay with us. Sky News Snow Report, sponsored by Ski Set, the online ski rental network. Welcome back. We're taking a look at tomorrow's newspapers with Julia Hartley Brewer and Susie Boniface. I love the way you silence as soon as you do. <laughs> That's the cue that we're on air. Um, let's take you it's through the rest of, yeah. <laughs> rest of the papers. Um, we're having a look at the eye now and uh, Theresa May's ideas for 
British industry, yes. what will give it a jab in the arm? Good luck with this one, eh? The, yes, the industrial strategy, it was uh, trailed in a lot of the Sunday papers, more detail coming out, a big speech from the Prime Minister on Monday. Um, one of the things that was trailed an awful lot today was this uh, £170 million for all these new sort of technical colleges, to, following the Germans with the te you know, technical education. £170 million doesn't go very far. We need billions for this. But the idea you of have training to start up, somewhere. You've got to start somewhere, but it's, if, it's, if, it's an, if it's an industrial strategy, we we need billions poured into it. Now there is talk about a lot of a lot more uh, modernisation, you know, 5G, whatever on earth that is. Uh, as long as my phone works, I haven't I don't got 3G is. where I live. <laughs> so 5G is well, just that's, like that's no, one and, of the problems. And this is offering unicorns. But, to is, me, but, you know. it's, but it is crucial this idea. Okay, we are going to compete on having a high skilled, highly paid workforce. We are not going to compete by, by you know trying to compete with Southeast Asian countries on 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 low on you know lowly lowly paid uh, employees. That, this is where our future lies. But I just don't think that we've got enough money going to this. And I'm never entirely sure that these sort of things develop out of a government strategy. They tend to develop, actually, when government goes, build the infrastructure and then hands off and let that happen. But I do find it extraordinary, for instance, when we're going to build, you know, HS2, against my better judgment, build, you know, Hinkley Point C, build all these things. We haven't actually got enough trained, skilled, technical and manual workers mm. to do this stuff. And, we and do, we, do you know what the ideas are behind this breaking down barriers? There's a few success. of them. What There's are the barriers? There's a paper that Julia's yeah. got sat over here, which is in a different piece of paper in the mail. Uh, Ten pillars to underpin the economy. Invest in science, research, innovation, which just means jam, unicorns, but that was already announced already. Uh, new emphasis on vocational skills for non-graduates, which is very important. Mm. I remember when I was coming through school, it was just, you must go to university. Everyone goes mm. to university. And that's completely useless to some people. I didn't go to university. It did me absolutely no harm whatsoever, well. as far as I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> and everything's fine. Um, no, no, I think that's a really important part of it. But say 170 million quid is going to solve I that. I know. It's just also going to upgrade um, various bits of infrastructure, including flood defences. Now, that costs billions alone. And the flood, as we know in the last few years, the mm. flooding's been really bad. It's cost billions of pounds worth of damage and insurance costs and so on. Yeah, that's, that's not just a, a pillar to something else you just chuck away as part of your industrial strategy. But there is it's a template. Funding. There's a template, yeah. so there's a start. Might not be as much as we want spent straight away, but it is a start. Let's continue on page four of the Times. Uh, this is about voters' views on Parliament. Yes, and finally, people are starting to think like me, or at least 25% of the, the world building. think like me, which is that if this House of Parliament, they keep saying it needs billions of pounds of refurbishment, it's going to take a decade to do, they've got to move out, they've got to go somewhere else, it's going to cost even more billions, blah, 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 blah. Why don't we just knock the damn thing down? Oh. Or sell it to Donald Trump. He can paint it gold and he'll have <laughs> it's not our problem anymore. Um, they can go, I mean, there's no reason on earth why all our MPs have to be in London. Although it's, oh, our, for goodness no, although it's our capital city, our MPs come from all over the country. We spend a lot of money flying them in or driving them in or coming in on railways. It would make much more sense to have it somewhere which is equidistant, which is um, the heart of the country, somewhere like in Birmingham, to have it in a conference centre there. The costs would be cheaper, the expenses would be a cheaper. conference centre, there's no... Do you know what capital city means? The whole yes. point is that you know, that is where the seat they, of government is. For they can sake. be anywhere. It's a digital age. No, they, no, they age. can't be anywhere. The whole place is falling no, down. It's no, the middle place, of the Parliament is falling rats. down, and it's Parliament no does need billions purpose. of pounds. It, it shouldn't cost it as much as they're going to. It could be a hotel. The Americans no, can sleep in it, and everyone will be happy. There are lots of arguments for changing the shape of the Parliament and this Yabu sort of, you know, oppositional sort of layout instead of the circular one that everyone seems to like now. No, this is a really important symbolic building we do need to spend the money on our heritage um, the, and the reality we is don't they have, are have that much money well uh, the awful truth is we do but the, it doesn't need to cost as much as that but the reality is if you, anyone who's actually worked in that building it, it is we got genuinely just, any we other building, just a private time. building a private building like that would just have been got time down. Julia to so tell us why um, uh, we've had our chips this in the sum yes. Yeah, I mean, all of the papers have got this, many on the front page, which is, I love that, boffins, but uh, scientists, basically, <laughs> despite, despite uh, not a specific study proving this, say it, it, it's, um, it's burning, well, having your toast too browned, uh, chips and roast potatoes Crispy apparently roast could potatoes. cause cancer. Basically, everything causes cancer now. All this Don't does enjoy life. is make me want chips. <laughs> I've had chips for quite a while. I had red right. potatoes this afternoon. They're I'm not going to stop browning my toast because then it <laughs> no. won't be toast. Very, very quickly, last story. Uh, teens can't smell sweat. <laughs> 
as if we needed Why? science to tell us this. <laughs> and it's, they just they all teens, or is it just teen boys? Well, this is the thing, they haven't actually broken it down by gender, and anyone could tell you that teen girls are very, very attuned to the smell of sweat. If you go in, well, I remember going into um, sport and PE lessons with girls, the amount of deodorant that was sprayed <laughs> in the washrooms was incredible. Susie Whereas and boys, Julia, uh, we haven't differentiated between uh, teen boys and teen girls, but suffice to say, I, I believe they can't smell, smell at all. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Stay with us.